I'll go do the I'll go do the previous slide. <laughs> so this is my kind of summary of the talk. It's moving from uh, manual workflows to automated workflows, as well as XML metadata to JSON. So to start off with a little bit about me, um, I started at Caltech in 2016. My background is actually computational chemistry and modeling, um, but I've been really thrilled working at a library and helping get information, research data, and software out to the world. Um, I manage our data repository. I work with researchers around data best practices, and I also write code, which is what I'm mostly going to be talking about today. Um, broadly about Caltech, Caltech is really small. We only have 300 faculty, um, but it's, the institution has a really large impact. We manage and co-manage some really large scientific facilities, um, like the LIGO interferometers, the Keck observatories, um, and we have some really high impact science um, happening on campus. Um, similarly, the library at Caltech is very small, um, but we do some really innovative um, boundary pushing work. Um, we've run an eprints based institutional repository since 2001, so it's really early in the, in the repository game. Um, we have under that umbrella of our repositories um, over 90,000 text works, so research publications, technical reports. Uh, we have over 10,000 theses um, that are available. It's almost a complete collection of the work from the institution. Um, and our Invineo based data repository launched in 2017. Um, so we have collected over 1,400 data sets and software. So we spent a lot of work um, trying to get um, the research and scientific output of the Institute um, available for everybody um, to access. So looking specifically at DOIs, um, when I started in 2016, we had a campus DOI service. Um, it was managed through EasyID. Um, so that was, you know, there were still data set DOIs, but it was through um, University of California's kind of consortium service. Um, and the switch from um, EasyID to direct membership happened at a really good time for us because it provided an opportunity to look at our workflows and to figure out where we could improve. Um, the research librarians had done an amazing job of scoping out the service. They'd service. Um, they'd done outreach to campus centers like LIGO or Seismolab and were minting DOIs for all of their data sets and products. Um, but where the limitation was is all of the DOI creation was happening through the EasyID form. Um, so lots of kind of copying and pasting metadata from the repository to generate the DOIs. So it was really inefficient. We weren't getting particularly complete um, metadata records. Um, when we launched Caltech Data, um, DOIs were a crucial component um, of the repository service. It's what researchers want. They need to fulfill their publisher or funder mandates. Um, and we have a kind of self-service repository model um, where researchers provide the metadata and they get their DOIs. Um, uh, technically, uh, the repository uses a JSON, meta JSON metadata model, um, which is very close to the, the data site schema. And one of the things that I worked really hard with our, um, our development partner, TIND, um, is to make sure that all of our metadata gets sent to data site. So when a record is created, when a record is edited, everything shows up on the, on the data site side with the DOIs. Um, I also use data site JSON um, in the Python API wrapper. So for folks that are doing integrations, um, they can just work with data site JSON metadata. Um, and so when I looked at kind of our other repositories and this canned copying and pasting thing, it was really clear we needed to do some automation. But we did this in a really deliberate way. We had a lot of existing workflows. Um, and so we did it kind of piece by piece. Um, and the, but the, the driving principle was our ePrints repositories have a lot of metadata. Um, and data sites should have it. So our librarians have done a great job of defining what metadata fields we should have for a thesis or for um, a technical report. And we want to make sure the data site can, is able to see that. Um, so the initial transformation was ePrints stores with metadata in XML. So we worked simply on the transformation from ePrints XML to data site XML. Um, and then you can take a look at the code. It's all openly available either at GitHub or the archived version. Um, and then once we had that XML metadata, we could use the Fabrica upload form to upload it and generate a DOI. So this is the simplest approach possible. Um, which is where we started. And we wanted to make sure that that metadata transform was giving us good results. 
Um, a question that we get a lot of at this point is why didn't we use a repository plugin? There's an eCrunch repository plugin for, for minting DOIs. Um, well, we want all our metadata mapped. And uh, oftentimes, if you look at what the repository plugins will do, they'll map some fields, a title, maybe some authors, maybe a description, um, but it doesn't map all the metadata. Um, so if you look at one of our thesis metadata, uh, our thesis version, we have 43 data set metadata fields that we're mapping into. Um, so by kind of doing this custom, by really thinking about what, how we wanted the mapping to work, um, we can get a lot of metadata that we can pass over. Um, this is just an example of an, an XML version. Um, this, by the way, is the thesis metadata record for Andrea Getz, who was this year's uh, Physics Nobel Prize laureate. Uh, we get to work with some really cool records at Caltech. Um, we also have to do custom handling for things like ORCIDs because we added ORCIDs into our metadata schema before ePrints had done it. Um, it, and it works a little bit differently. Similarly, we have some dates that we indicate for when stuff was digitized versus the graduation date, majors and minors groups. There's a lot of fields that we at Caltech know how to handle but wouldn't be handled in a standard repository plugin. And our approach has been really deliberate. So once we were sure that that metadata transformation worked, we added in automating downloading from the repository instead of having to manually download the XML. We added in automatic uploading through the MDS API, so to get DOIs. And then we added putting that DOI back into the ePrints repository, this little REST API that allows you to get certain fields. So we now have a, a kind of one-stop solution of you put in the record you want to make the DOI for, you hit enter, it sends it over to the data site, gives the DOI, puts it back in the repository all in one step. But we did this uh, sequentially. We wouldn't have to, it didn't have to be this one big project that we're going to build this whole thing. We just did a little bit piece by piece. And we've slowly expanded features. So we've added new content types with different mappings like technical reports and books. And we've worked with new publishers. Um, so for the Keck Institute for Space Studies, they do all these reports. We were able to give them a custom prefix and modify the metadata mapping so it mapped with what, how they wanted their publications to show. So what was the technical approach? Um, so we started with an existing Python library to do the metadata validation and generating the XML. Uh, it happens to be the same module that's used in the Vineyard repository system. So this is a, a nice coincidence that we were able to work on something that can also impact repository developments. It uses a JSON schema to translate that XML. So the way that it works is basically we have your, your reference XML, we bring that into JSON in Python or you know, effectively a dictionary, and then we spit out the data site XML at the end. Okay, so that worked. We were able to generate our DOIs automatically. So what's, what are the next steps? What's the future? Uh, well, Invinio RDM is a community developed turnkey Invinio repository. Um, so what you can think about this is it's, it's Zenodo, but customized. Um, and the reason we're excited about this is it allows us to more sustainably maintain our, our Caltech data repository. So instead of it just being a customization just for us, um, there's a lot of institutions that are in this uh, partnership uh, we can use a similar code base. Uh, the metadata is basically data site, um, and the internal metadata is all JSON. And so what this project raised for me is, you know, could we skip producing the data site XML? If we're already working with this as JSON internally, could we just use the REST API and use data site JSON? Um, so I wanted to demonstrate this type of workflow. And so I took our existing Caltech DOI automation, and made some modifications. So instead of using data set XML, we can use data set JSON. And instead of um, automatically uploading it with the MDS API, I switched to the REST API. Okay, so what's the, what was the impact of this? Well, there's a couple of technical details that we had to do first. Um, so for the 4.2 and 4.3 releases, um, data site provided a JSON schema. Um, so I was able to take that um, and include it into the Invideo package. I also did a wrapper for the REST API um, and put that into the Vineo package. The, the wrapper I think is really nice because um, it better fits um, how Fabrica works in terms of the data and in terms of the DOI states. Um, so you don't have to think about it in terms of API calls, you can think about it, I want to transfer DOIs between a certain set of states. Um, so it allows us to it would it allows us to really easily flip um, our existing scripts into basically all JSON. So what were some of the challenges that we ran into? Well, um, as part of the development of this package, um, I added in live testing for the data site REST API. Um, so the, the uh, Vineo data site package 
um, had testing against the static version of the API, which is really nice for automated testing. Um, but as the data set APIs uh, shift, um, that come, kind of becomes out of date. So I've added in the ability to, if you have a data site test username and password, you can take um, all of the example metadata that, that is available and mint DOIs in the test system for it. Um, and what this did is it highlighted some inconsistencies between the JSON schema and how the REST API expects the metadata. And I kind of think of this process as, as sanding the edges. I kind of you know, went to the, the, the Python implementation and adjusted that a little bit, went to the, the data site JSON schema, adjusted that a little bit, and we've been able to get it so we can validate basically all of the, the metadata. You know, some of these changes are really small things, like whether we call label identifier or identifiers, if we have identifiers and alternative identif identifier and alternative identifiers, we club them all to one field. Uh, you know, are geographic points floats or strings? What type of dates or for what type of date formats are accepted? Um, is it contributor name or name? Do we have to have the JSON implementation of this be an exact match to the XML or just close to the XML? Um, so there's a lot of discussions on GitHub about this. Um, I think we've gotten close, but there's probably still some improvements. And as the metadata versions improve and change, we're going to have to keep doing this. So this type of metadata work um, is a kind of continuous improvement process. But what's the impact? So I've done all this technical work. I've done all this extra programming. Um, why do we care about doing all this work? Why do we care that we switch from the XML to the JSON? Uh, well, what we were able to do in our test version is we were able to add raw identifiers to all of our thesis records. So because we had 4.3 version metadata available, um, we could add the raw identifiers for the affiliations. Theses are actually very easy to do this because um, all the affiliations are Caltech. We know that. Um, and the thing that I love showing is if you register all your metadata, things just happen. So if you look at data site comments today, you go to Caltech for with our roar, you select text as your item type, you can see a graph of our theses over time. If the graph is larger, we can actually go back in time and see you know, how many theses uh, have Caltech produced. It's not 100% theses because we have some technical reports in there because we don't have a theses facet, but um, this is basically, you know, we got this graphing um, for no work. And that's talks to the folks at the data site. It just behaved once we registered all the metadata. And I don't want to pick on any specific institutions, but if you look at a lot of some other large institutions um, that use that minute registered DOIs for their theses through a repository plugin, you get some really kind of weird results because those raw identifiers, the metadata is just not there. Um, so thank you all for listening. Um, I really have to thank the amazing Celtic Library staff, um, particularly Kathy Johnson, um, who does all of our thesis work and managing that repository, Melissa Ray, who does um, a lot of our thesis management, George Porter um, for authors, and we just have a really great staff that's, that's able to allow us to work on interesting and cool projects and put up with changing workflows. Um, you want to see an example? Code is available on GitHub. You want to contribute um, in video. Python library is available for contributions. And if you want to chat, there's my information. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Tom. That was a very interesting talk. I was wondering what happens after the onboarding. You laid out a great picture of this. And I think many of you are thinking about transitioning to JSON, hopefully. <laughs> OK, so our next um, exciting presentation is held by Harrison Nobrega from our Brazil consortium. And he will speak about building a data site consortium. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, one moment, I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, is it worked? Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Harrison, project manage, manager at RNP. Uh, RNP is an organization under the Minister of Science and Technology from Brazil. And I will talk a, a little about uh, Connecting Initiative. Uh, the Connect was created in 2018 when six institutions related uh, to an education department, CAPES, uh, CONFAP, IBIC, RNP, and Cielo together deliberate about and making a consortium. 
Uh, the agreement had a goal to connect the academic community with the technical research related with uh, the environment universities. One moment. So uh, the main objective was to try to uh, enforce solve internal problems each participating agents, which alone would not take more time and would require more research to be solved. In this way, uh, the creation of the service desk that could be shared among the participants was con conceived. Uh, it's uh, the center of idea from Connect. Uh, after some conversation and research, we identified that a common problem for everyone was the quality of the data on each government platform. Um, Brazil will have uh, many platforms in the government. So uh, we start to study and identify what we call uh, the good keys source of information and that its government platform could be fit on and reduce the reworking of the data entered by researchers. The result of the work was uh, to identify the source of information necessary uh, for each department. We identified search from people, uh, graduate programs, and institution, and called it it's the primary information. Through this correct identification, we arrive at the derived information where we say, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous, okay where you saw the important role of university and create information for the ecosystem. After the correct identification of the derived source, we arrived at the external source that make up uh, the developer agents, uh, some, uh, like some articles, books, journals, patents, technical and technological production, among others. Uh, all these uh, supported by the personal data protection in Brazil we call LGPD. Uh, in this way, we have data entry by primary, derived, and external sources, where the data is collected, distributed. Uh, among members and trade by the tools the developer developed in Connect team. After processing data, I manage website uh, for the end user and information search system for the partners platform are available. So we have the project divided into three fronts. Uh, the tools to support the integration of systems that are responsible for exposing data, collecting, translating, and trading information. Uh, the legal front responsible for allocating and guaranteeing the privacy pro uh, protection policy of personal data storage on the Connect platform. And finally, the management website that aims to show us in a single system all the information of the researchers that travel between the several platforms in Brazilian government. With an embassy on delivery already made, uh, we will talk uh, a little bit about the project creation with the developer team. So, uh, which is based on the liver. Uh, in the picture, we can see how is the IT architecture of the project. 
where we build five services for the partners. Uh, the first in, the first service is a uh, exhibitor. Uh, the data integration and the, is the second, and the narrow uh, narrow traded world network here uh, is the the third. The identified basis uh, unified basis here, and the website here from the research. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I will detail the, the first two products, right? The Zipter and integration, integrator. Uh, the first solution developed by the team, uh, the developed team, uh, was the creator of the data display uh, we call the Zipter, which is beginning implement in the technological part of the each participant. And the second solution here, uh, Developer was a API uh, consumption platform. We call the integration. Uh, we will consume the data sharing by Zipto or by another proprietary property, property solution and power the connected environment. Oh, sorry. Uh, finally, we have here uh, the progress of the project with the base connectors. Uh, we, uh, we index bases uh, from Scalpel, Cielo, Arc ID, uh, Google Schooler, Google Books, Amazon Books, ESPNGB, uh, Crosshair, ROR, ERSNI, um, the patents uh, USPTO, and this one is uh, universities connected to us. Um, uh, that's it. I would leave uh, my contacts here if they want more details about the technology development for my team. It's here. So that's it. Thanks a lot. Uh, obrigado, pessoal. Thank you very much, Harrison, for giving us insight into your interesting uh, work and very impressive work in Brazil. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry by my, my English, but because I have very nervous uh, here. It's oh. my first time in the, the this group. Um, and I really, I, I'm a nervous. <laughs> oh, your English is excellent. And you didn't sound nervous at all. I mean, this was very uh, complicated information. Um, yeah, and it's uh, I don't I don't think I understood all of it. So there are lots of <laughs> Yeah, but Thank very you. nice. Thank you very much. So um, our next speaker is Anne Rowe um, from uh, the University of Maryland. And I hope she has great news about a new version of the metadata schema. Please go ahead, Anne. I've lost all my buttons. All right, here we go. So the next metadata schema release will be a minor version. Hi, by the way, hi, I'm Ann Rao from the University of Maryland. Uh, the project that I work on is the Planetary Data System Project. I'm also a member of the Metadata Working Group along with these, uh, there we go, along with these folks. Uh, and I hope I have managed to follow the changes in the group to get everything up to date. Up to date. I want to give you a quick overview of the additions planned for the next release of the schema. It's a minor release, as I said, which means it will be backwards compatible. Um, more of our members are assigning DOIs to traditional publications, the print publications, journal articles, books, chapters, things like that. Uh, and the additions to the schema this time are heavily focused on responding to the requests from those users for more specificity when they're defining metadata for these DOIs. The first edition involves the resource type property, specifically its resource type general sub property. The current control value list for resource type general contains only one value applicable to traditional publications, just text. 
we're adding a number of more specific values to the controlled valued list, and you can see them here. We looked at the taxonomies used by both Crossref and the citation style language, CSL, that's used by CITPROC, CITPROC, and we selected a set of 10 terms that directly map between CIT, Crossref and CITPROC uh, for that purpose. And that's what the first 10 terms are from journal up through preprint. Then we added data management plan and peer review to the list because these documents are significant for data sets and people may be seeking them out specifically. Uh, and also it, it speaks to things like data quality and uh, fairness compliance and things like that. And finally, computational notebook was added because we've been getting requests about assigning DOIs to things like Jupyter notebooks, where you actually have an interactive site that is static in its start position and then the user can interact with it. Now remember that resource type general is actually a required subproperty of resource type, which is itself a required property. It's used in citation formation. Uh, so these new values provide additional hooks for automated processing of citations, as well as providing for more information than just text for these traditional publications as users are using them. But it is important to note that there will be a change in the guidance regarding the use of resource type and resource type general with respect to these traditional text publications. The previous recommendation for text publications was to use text as your resource type general, and then consult a list that was maintained by an organization named CASRI for a more specific value from their taxonomy to use as the value of resource type. Well, CASRI no longer maintains that list. And in fact, it is not even possible to find a current version of that list posted anywhere at, these type, at that site. So these types should be able to fill in that gap while simultaneously allowing users to provide even an additional level of information about these publications. So let me show you a few examples, which I think will help illustrate the sort of thing that we're looking to support. So these are some new values. <clears throat> so your resource type general might be book chapter, and then the free text information resource type might be invited review, describing the type of the content. Similarly, for conference papers, some conferences publish full papers, some conference papers are just abstracts. Now you can note that. For computational notebook, you can indicate the type of platform that you're running on, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, for report, data maturity assessment is a report type that you may very well want to specify once you can use your text and you don't have to simply say report. If you like to see these things in XML, this is what they would look like in XML. I will give you a moment to take in the beauty of tagged text. The next addition is to the subject property. This is an optional property, <clears throat> excuse me, but very popular with users because it contains search terms. We're going to add a new sub property called classification to the subject property. Currently, it works best with taxonomies that are built on URIs, but the number of URI-based taxonomies is relatively small, especially when you get into the realm of traditional publications. So the classification subproperty is designed to help with that and to avoid stuffing more information into the classification, into the subject itself, what ought to be just the term or concept. Uh, and, and right now you have to jury rig things that don't have URIs by putting an additional classification code into the text field. This will allow this to be uh, separated out. So uh, again, an example is probably more instructive than what I'm saying. Here's something that we can accommodate now. So the subject term that I want to include is short period comets. I have a, a scheme, the Unified Astronomy Thesaurus. It's got a URI that describes the scheme as a whole, and it uses URIs to identify each of its values. So the value reference means that if the human being who's typing misspells things or the capitalization is different, you can resolve references through the value URI. It works very well. If you are working with a taxonomy that does not have URIs, however, you might be working in the field of economics. There's a well-known classification system known as the gel code system, Journal of Economic Literature, that assigns uh, concept codes to each of the concepts. It has a scheme name. It has a scheme URI. There's a website that describes in, in 
detail what these codes mean and what they represent. They just don't provide URIs that you can use to reference individual terms. So in this case, you would use the new classification subproperty to contain the specific code that you want to reference. And I've included the XML below so that you can see what that looks like in practice. And it moves the classification out of the text field down here where it used to live and up here into a tagged field where it can now be retrieved. There will be one more major addition to the schema to address several issues that revolve around traditional publications that are very closely related and probably need to be solved together. <clears throat> we're still working on the solution. We expect to wrap this up in November, but I want to explain what we're talking about because every time we start talking about them, we end up veering off into these related subjects. So the primary one is this question of series information. We have members who need to provide metadata for publications that are part of an ongoing journal or book series. And in order to create the proper citations for these through something like CitePROC, it is necessary to have the information for the containing publication readily available in the metadata for the specific resource that's getting the DOI. Referencing it via the related identifier property isn't sufficient in this case because things like CitePROC don't dereference those identifiers in order to get the information you would need to complete the citation. So it needs to be in structured fields where it can be gathered and passed to these other APIs. In order to add this cleanly without creating a non-backwards compatible change, we plan to add a new major property to the schema with sub-properties to hold the specific fields needed. So it'll be at the same level as resource type, for example, um, but probably added at the end of the XML schema for structural reasons. Uh, and it will have structured text within it instead of a free format text field. So I've given you a couple of examples here where uh, members need this sort of information. For example, if they're assigning a, a DOI to an article, that article is published in a journal which has its own identifier, an ISSN, for example. The series information in this case includes the name and identifier of the journal, plus also the volume number and the pages that contain the actual article. And it's easy to recognize these as being traditional parts of a citation for the article, but there is not a place for them in the basic data site metadata schema because it was designed for data sets. Or consider a case where the resource that you want to assign a DOI to is a chapter in a book. The book has its own identifier, of course, as a publication. In addition, the book might be one of a series of books like conference proceedings that also has its own identifier. So this can actually be layered information. Uh, the series information is the name of the book, the chapter of the resource, the name of the book in the series, maybe a volume number of that book in the series, all things that need to be called out separately if you want to be able to include them in a call to CitePROC or to automatically generate citations for this particular work. So this is what we've been wrestling with and the sort of fields that we're talking about are titles of the enclosing publication, the type, whether it's a journal or a book or a series of books, that sort of thing, digital identifiers, if they have them, the volume number, issue number, chapter number, some journals now, electronically published journals are using article numbers, some are still using traditional page ranges. So these are the sort of things we're looking to include. As we got to talking about that, we have a second issue with uh, references, and this is now up in the area of related identifiers. We have users that are requesting to add the full reference metadata corresponding to the related identifiers in structured fields. For traditional publications, this is very close to what is being requested for series information, although it has a very different purpose. So we're looking at possibly being able to use the same solution for both requests. Uh, but if we add the capability for traditional publications, we have to make sure it can also handle references to data sets and software. Where they intersect is at that related identifier level, because we do have relationships like is part of, which applies to an article in a journal um, and, and could be used. So you might expect to find it up in that class. But the fact that we can't turn related identifier from a simple content give us a string thing into something that contains textured 
structured data uh, is what necessitates the need to add this major class. And then there's a further complication. Uh, we have the case of a resource that needs to cite a previous work that does not have a digital identifier of any kind. In this case, a structured property would make it easier in the future for a member to go back through and extract information from their existing data site metadata and query the DOI database to discover new DOIs that have been issued to legacy resources and update the metadata. So uh, adopting a structured solution for dealing with this particular problem is long-term preferable to just allowing the related identifier to contain a long text string. If we can find a way to solve all three of these problems in a backwards compatible way, then we will do that with the 4.4 schema. It's not entirely clear that we can hit all of them, but I've presented them in the priority that we've assigned to them, I believe. So the series information will certainly be there uh, and we will see what we can do with the rest. The target date for the release is January of 2021, which is why November will be the uh, fish or cut bait point, as we say, for the um, series information object. As always, your comments and suggestions and feedback are very welcome. Here are the two ways for doing that. 